APCO Educational Topic Number 36, Sexually Transmitted Infections and Urinary Tract Infections. Hello and welcome to Gynecology National News. My name is Victoria Deuce and tonight we will delve into sexually transmitted infections. All forms of sexual contact can spread sexually transmitted infections including penetrative sex, oral sex, anal sex, sharing sex toys, and skin-to-skin -skin contact. Over 50% of new infections annually are in people less than 25. Do you know where the young people in your life are right now? The objectives of this video are to describe the guidelines for STI screening and partner notification and treatment, discuss STI prevention strategies including immunization, describe the symptoms, physical exam findings, evaluation and management of common STIs, discuss the pathophysiology, evaluation, diagnostic criteria, initial management, and possible long-term sequelae of salpingitis and pelvic inflammatory disease. And lastly, describe the diagnosis and management of urinary tract infections. Welcome back, folks. Let's start with screening. Should we be screening patients more for STIs? This reporter went to the gynecology clinic to find the answers. Dr. Maya Hamoud, tell us how women's health care providers should be screening for STIs. Well, VD, screening recommendations are different based on sex, age, and sexual practices. The Centers for Disease Control recommend that women less than 25 should have annual screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And what about women older than 25? They should be screened if they have new or multiple partners or a partner with known STD. What about pregnant women? All pregnant women should be screened for syphilis, gonorrhea and chlamydia, HIV, and hepatitis B in the first trimester. Tests should be repeated for high-risk patients in the third trimester. Any other recommendations? All people aged 13 to 64 should be screened for HIV at least once, then repeat annually if high risk. All men who have sex with men should have an annual gonorrhea and chlamydia screen, and anyone who shares injection drug equipment or has unsafe sex should be screened for HIV annually. Whoa, what can we do to protect ourselves against STIs? Let's start with the basics. Number one, delay the onset of sexual activity. Number two, try to limit the number of partners. Number three, use condoms. Number four, partner notification. Expedited therapy refers to a patient's sexual partner receiving drug therapy for an STI without undergoing a physical examination or testing. Vaccination is another form of prevention. Some strains of the human papillomavirus cause genital warts and cervical cancer. There are three vaccinations currently available that protect against low and high risk HPV strains. The vaccines contain virus-like particles and are recommended for boys and girls aged 11 to 12. They can be given between the ages of 9 and 26 and ideally should be given before the initiation of sexual intercourse. Lastly, new on the scene is PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV. This is a daily pill which is a combination of tenovavir and emtricitabine for people engaged in high-risk sexual activity such as a partner with known HIV. Let's now move on to common STIs. As mentioned earlier, many STIs are asymptomatic, underlying the importance of screening. Chlamydia is the most frequently reported infectious disease in the United States. It can have a full spectrum of disease from asymptomatic to mucopurulent cervicitis. Here is a photograph of a cervix with mucopurulent discharge, pelvic inflammatory disease, urethritis, to vertical transmission to infants at delivery resulting in ophthalmia neonatorum and or pneumonia. Treatment for chlamydia is oral azithromycin or doxycycline and it's very important for the partner to get treated as well. Gonorrhea is the second most common STI in the United States. Women younger than 25 are at highest risk. It tends to be more symptomatic than chlamydia and in men the infection is characterized by mucopurulent or purulent discharge from the urethra. In women the symptoms can be mild enough to be overlooked and can include purulent discharge from the urethra, cervix, vagina, or anus. The diagnosis of gonorrhea and chlamydia is made by PCR amplification of either a urine or a cervical discharge sample. Treatment for gonorrhea is ceftriaxone, however given the high likelihood of concurrent chlamydial infection, positive gonorrhea results should lead to treatment for chlamydia treatment as well, so the treatment will be ceftriaxone plus azithromycin or doxycycline. Let's now move to pelvic inflammatory disease. PID is an ascending infection of typically gonorrhea and chlamydia. Here is the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. That bacteria ascend from the cervix up through the endometrium and into the fallopian tubes. This leads to an inflammatory process which will create swollen mucosal and serosal surfaces of the fallopian tubes. Anaerobic organisms can flourish and grow in this fluid collection which can lead to a tubo-ovarian abscess. Even without a tubo-ovarian abscess, 
Fibrin deposition can lead to scarring of the fallopian tubes, the pelvic peritoneum, and ovaries. This photograph shows a dilated and likely scarred right fallopian tube. Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome refers to the rare infection of the liver capsule and peritoneal surfaces of the liver. Here is the liver, the diaphragm, and the fibrinous exudates from PID. The diagnosis of PID can be difficult and challenging because of the wide variation of symptoms and signs and the clinical diagnosis is imprecise. Delaying diagnosis can lead to potential damage to the reproductive health for young women. This illustration shows a fallopian tube that's been damaged by PID and early intervention is meant to try to prevent this from occurring. Thus, the Centers for Disease Control recommend that treatment for PID should be initiated in sexually active young women with pelvic or lower abdominal pain and cervical motion tenderness or uterine tenderness or adnexal tenderness. An elevated temperature, white blood cell greater than 10,000, or frank purulent discharge from the cervix can help in making the diagnosis, but treatment should be initiated even without these findings. The treatment of PID involves 10 to 14 days of antibiotics, either oral or parental. One common antibiotic regimen is cefoxetine plus doxycycline. This is known as the FOXY-DOXY regimen. The sequelae of PID can be severe and are common. Infertility in 10 to 20 percent, ectopic pregnancy in 6 to 10 percent, chronic pelvic pain in 15 to 20 percent, and 25 percent of PID patients will have at least one of these sequelae. Let's move now to other important and common STIs. Let's start with trichomonas. Women with trichomonas may have increased frothy greenish-yellow discharge and vulvar itching and irritation. Diagnosis is made by the wet prep. Here is a photograph of the flagellated parasite. On wet prep, this organism will be seen often moving rapidly around the slide. Treatment for trichomonas is a single 2-gram dose of metronidazole. Herpes is a very common infection, and up to 75% of primary infections go unrecognized. The HSV-1 strain typically causes oral lesions, and the HSV-2 strain typically leads to genital lesions. There is, however, now an increasing proportion of new genital infections due to HSV-1. The initial presentation can be very painful and severe. Painful vesicles can appear on the vulva, vagina, cervix, perineum, and perianal skin. These vesicles are extremely tender, and patients may develop urinary retention from pain and or urethral and bladder involvement. Here is a helpful teaching tip. A patient presenting with painful vulvar symptoms and urinary retention is often having a primary herpes outbreak. Treatment is with the antiviral acyclovir, famcyclovir, or valacyclovir. Episodic treatment means treatment at the time of recurrence. This decreases the duration of the episode. Suppressive therapy refers to daily therapy and prevents 80% of recurrences and results in a 48% reduction in viral transmission between sexual partners. Let's now change gears as this reporter will share a personal journey of my experience with a urinary tract infection. It started one day when I developed suprapubic pain, urinary frequency, and blood in my urine. The diagnosis was made with a urine analysis. This measured the pH, protein level, presence of nitrites, white blood cells, and leukocyte esterase. A urine sample can also be sent to the lab for culture. My healthcare provider treated me with a three-day course of trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. He could have also treated me with a three-day course of fluoroquinolone. I want to get to the source of why UTIs are more common in women. It turns out that women have a shorter urethra length, their meatus gets exposed to vestibular and rectal pathogens, and sexual activity may induce trauma or other organisms which all increase the potential for infection. 11% of U.S. women will report at least one physician-diagnosed UTI per year, and the lifetime probability that a woman will have a UTI is 60%. This concludes our expose on STIs and UTIs. We have reviewed STI screening, partner notification, symptoms and physical exam findings of common STIs. We reviewed PID and UTIs. And that's the way it is. This is Victoria Deuce, and on behalf of Dr. Maya Hamoud, good night.